Rebecca Hall is a scholar, activist, and educator, and she received her PhD in history with a minor in feminist studies from UC Santa Barbara. A 2020 to 2021 scholar in residence at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Hall has, Dr. Hall has taught at UC Santa Cruz, UC Berkeley, and was a visiting professor of law at the University of Utah. Dr. Hall has worked to support movements in women's and LGBTQ plus rights, climate justice and Black Lives Matter. Dr. Hall, thank you so much for being with us, albeit virtually at the American Library in Paris this evening. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, um, as I was saying, I love Paris and I, I wish this was in person. <laughs> but... And as, as I was saying, as I say to, to many of our, to our Zoomers, um, we're very happy to have you back um, whenever you can make it. So we'll hopefully be seeing you soon. Um, so uh, there are so many ways into this into this book, um, and I suppose one way is um, the origin of it, yes. um, which is at once academic uh, as much as it is personal. And so if you could just speak uh, as we get started here, Dr. Hall, what was the origin of the book? Uh, like, why did I write it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as I describe in the book, um, I was an attorney. Um, I mean, I still am an attorney. I haven't been disbarred or anything, <laughs> but um, I, I went to UC Berkeley and then practiced law in Oakland for eight years, um, representing low income tenants. And um, I got very frustrated with the ways in which I could see that race and gender was shaping the possibilities of justice, like deforming it. And I, I knew that it had something to do with the legacy of slavery, but I wasn't sure how. And so I went back to get my PhD in history. I got my BA in history. I've always loved history. Um, and, but, but instead I did the law school path instead of the PhD path originally because I thought I'd be frustrated being like in the ivory tower and wouldn't be able to do anything relevant or, you know, so that was my thinking in my <laughs> mid twenties. But anyway, um, so yeah, so, um, you know, uh, this book, uh, this graphic uh, narrative, not a huge fan of the term graphic novel um, because novel to me implies fiction, um, but, you know, it's me like crying in the wind. <laughs> the whole genre has already been defined. So, but I, I'll, graphic, I'll graphic, graphic, graphic narrative is, is fine. That's great. Okay. <laughs> great. Um, but um, so uh, I guess 2017, I decided to turn my dissertation into a graphic narrative. Um, and I'm chuckling because I had only ever written and published in academia. Um, and so I'd never written anything like this. And um, all I knew about graphic novels was from reading them, you know, and I enjoy them particularly. So you, you're a fan, you, 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 you've read graphic novels and graphic narratives um, kind of for fun in, in your spare time? Well, yeah, uh, yeah, for fun, but also for like, I've taught uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, for right. example, um, which is really kind of an inspiration for, for me in, in this book. And so once I decided to do this. Um, it, so it, I had to learn how to write a script for a graphic uh, narrative. And there was nothing that taught you how to do that. Um, like, <laughs> I was like I, most, most of these works are created by combinations of writer artists. So the process of like, I'm going to create this script, which is then going to communicate to um, my illustrator, Hugo Martinez, just shout out, he's amazing. Um, I, what I want to see visually and what does this process of working back and forth even look like? We could talk about that more later. Um, but um, so I had to completely wing it. I had to learn it. It was like a huge, steep learning curve. So now this is my current career. I'm going to write graphic narratives for the rest of my life. You are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and how the personal part, yeah, it was kind of strange because my original idea was I'm going to turn this into a graphic narrative because. So can I just I, ask you just before we get into this personal part, why graphic narrative and not a novel? Why not a TV series? Why not a film? I mean, that. 
Right, right. So the graphic medium allows you to do certain things that you really can't do in other mediums. Uh, it's incredibly generative in that it allows a big part of my book is putting the past up against the present. Like, and um, I think you can do that um, using the methodology of a graphic novel, which is kind of the arrangements of panels and gutters. Gutter is the, the space between panels. That's how it's described. Um, you know, that you can't really I, do in another medium. And also the people that I research, the record of their lives are, is incredibly fragmentary. And, um, and so the methodology of the graphic narrative with this arrangement of parent, uh, panels and gutters uh, uh, allows me to pull together and construct a story in a way that's uh, much easier than trying to do that in prose, unless I was the brilliant Cydia Hartman and could figure out how to do it. <laughs> Sorry, I love her recent book. So, yeah. so did you find it th therefore a challenge when you were writing your uh, PhD dissertation? Or was that not an issue because the present didn't feature so heavily in that? No, the present didn't feature in it at all. Uh, well, not really at all. Um, uh, it, it was kind of a traditional history PhD uh, dissertation. Uh, what, what I would like to do, if it's okay, is um, actually share an image. Mm -hmm, sure. Look, would that be all right? So I, I have the, I'm gonna just get this up so we can see. Um, this, I, this, so this is a kind of example. This is from early on in the book. Um, this is in the prologue, I believe. And so- yeah, It is. Um, I'm just shaking my head because that took like Hugo and I about 40 hours to figure out. Oh, so it, was, tell it us. was the hardest, so it was- hmm? Oh, tell us what, what was hard well, to figure out. Okay, so using this concept of wake, and as the book is being picked up in multiple other languages, unfortunately, this concept doesn't have these multiple valences in other languages. Yeah. I don't know in French if that's true, but um, so, you know, like living in the wake is, you know, being impacted by something, um, the wake of a ship, um, a wake is in a funeral to like honor the dead. Um, and I wanted to create a page that used the actual wake of the ship as the gutters uh, between the panels. Um, and I wanted to show how, how, um, I mean, this is sort of, uh, this hand emerging from the water, we learn as we read the book, is one of the women who are involved in this uh, slave ship revolt aboard the Unity. And, you know, she's indicating to me as I'm doing research in, in the UK, um, look at this ship record. This is the one where I'm in it, you know? And I wanna talk about um, being hunted and haunted by the past. And so it just really took us a long time to figure, figure that out. But I'm, I'm really happy with how it, how it turned out. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna bring in the images because they're so important. Uh, and I'm so glad that we landed on, on it. I was so moved by that um, mm, first you. image uh, when, I, when I was reading it and rereading it. Um, so, so tell us now about the, your personal relationship, the story, right. the story that you brought in the, in a way that you didn't bring in with your, your PhD. Right, right. So, as, so the goal of the, of the graphic narrative was to make the story more accessible, the history more accessible, while maintaining all of its complexity. Um, and, you know, and, and so um, I wanted to do that. And as I was writing the script, I realized that I needed to put myself in the book in order to, to, to pull these stories together in a way that made sense. Because like I said, the record's very fragmentary. So I needed to be in there talking about, okay, this happened, this happened. And then when, once I was in there, right? It was like, well, I'm now a character in my own book. <laughs> I think they're gonna have the action toys. <laughs> the historian, that'd be funny. Um, anyway, um, I, I realized that it was important for me to, to write what was true and what was scary. Otherwise, why write? Um, and so I wrote about my research process and I wrote about the tremendous obstacles to the research process. 
And as I was writing all that, um, the other thing I think it's important for people to know is that my paternal grandparents were born enslaved. Um, and so there's a very direct and close connection for me personally. Um, and that's probably unusual. I just turned 59, I think, yeah, like 10 days ago. And so I don't know of any other person who's alive today whose grandparents, I'm not talking about my great grandparents, were actually born enslaved. Um, both of them were actually born in 1860, my grandmother on a plantation in Virginia and my grandfather on a plantation in Tennessee. Um, that one of the things when I was writing my dissertation back, whatever it was, 15, 20 years before writing this graphic novel, was uh, it, it was really hard for me in lots of places. And I dedicated it to my grandmother, to Harriet Thorpe. Um, and I dedicate this uh, graphic narrative to her as well. And even though we never met, obviously she died long before I was born, um, I felt like I was drawing on her strength. Um, I felt like, you know, if my ancestors could live in slavery, then I could research it, you know, and I think it helped me to sort of stay focused uh, and continue doing this, this task, even though it was very painful in a lot of ways. So my grandmother shows up in the book. <laughs> right, I, I, and I, was, I think that's one of the most moving moments where you feel depleted and, and emotionally and, and physically exhausted by this research. And so you invoke her. And you have this kind of spiritual conversation with her. Can you talk about that? Yeah, and I'm so not, uh, so okay. So I'm still not a spiritual person, um, and I had to kind of get over myself in the process when I was writing it. And and I really focused on on trying to talk with her. Um, I think it was after the reading the thousand plus slave ship captain's logs and I was like uh, oh I can't do this anymore and um talking with sort of I made a little altar and then tried to talk with her while not believing in any of this um <laughs> but ironically it was really it was really helpful and um this whole process of creating this book and then what has happened after it was published is so insane um that I part of me just feels like, yeah, um, she's helping me somehow, you know, and part of the book too, and the other valence for the term wake is what it's like to live with the legacy of slavery. Um, and we can talk more about that, I'm sure. But um, so, so that's kind of all the, the meanings of wake and how they're, they're used in, in the book. Mm -mm. Great. Um, I, I want to go back to to the more kind of historical. It, it's what's so fantastic um, uh, and so brilliant. I think about your book is is there all there are so many um, different parts of your life and different parts of the subject matter that find their way into this, and they're all intertwined. And you manage mm -hmm. to hold all of the differences and and all of them at the same time, and also manage to portray them visually. So it's it's a huge triumph um but and from a and we were kind of talking about this before before the uh, the official call the official event um from a historical point of view from a kind of process or method based point of view it's also uh fascinating because you are coming up against questions that every historian grapples with but in your case they're much more acute because you're trying to research the topic um where there aren't many documents, and even if there are documents, you're um, doing a kind of a process that historians call reading against the grain or reading between the lines. And this is assuming that there are any documents at all. Can you talk about yeah, um, I mean, your, your method? Yeah, and I think in addition to everything you just said, which is true, um, I was also writing against this really powerful, very aggressive you know, historiography uh, of that insisted that women were not involved in slave revolt and historiography for the non like history nerds is really kind of like, like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is the, is, yeah. what I'm just gonna say the history nerds who who read content of the form by Hayden White and that's yeah, right, right. <laughs> um you know it it's sort of the methodology of, of history. I mean, it's about, it, it, historiography, it, historiography is sort of the studying of, the, of, of how history is written. 
in, in this sense, it's how our understanding of historical events change over time. Um, and what's at stake in these different perspectives? Like what causes this perspective when you're writing about something like when this history of slavery is being written, you know, in the early 20th century, what was the context, the social and political context of that? I mean, every history, everything is written in a social and political context. And um, the short answer to this, because, you know, I could spend like five minutes talking about the specific historiography of slave revolt, but trust me when I say <laughs> there had a lot, there was a lot, um, oh, and if anyone's interested, I'm happy to just go into more detail, but um, there was a lot of contention about the issue of gender um, and race and gender uh, within the black community in the United States. A and at the same time, historians were, were working to reclaim this history of the resistance of the enslaved because the historians who wrote before were basically the descendants of slave owners and their, the way they wrote history about slavery and what you would read until, you know, at least, you know, through the sixties, maybe even the early seventies is that um, slavery was a benign institution and it was uh, a civilizing force and everybody was happy with it. And therefore there was no resistance, right? To slavery. And then these later people came to reclaim that. And here I'm telling you the whole story. <laughs> I'm almost done with the whole story. Please, please, please. <laughs> okay. Um, and at the same time, this is happening. There's this whole thing happening in the United States. It's like the war on poverty and trying to figure out like what's going on and why do we have so much inequality and and the kind of the official government position became the problem with black people is not racism. It's not institutionalized racism. Uh, they are in poverty and can't advance because their gender roles are deformed. Um, and uh, this came from slavery where the black woman was the matriarch. It's like pause, what? How can you ever be a matriarch as an enslaved person? I never got that. And these uh, black matriarchal women emasculate their men, right? And they live, black people live in these female headed households, which sounds like a monster, right? Like Medusa or something. Um, and so this was so powerful that, you know, people were pushing against it so hard and how they were pushing against it is like, they'd write a whole book on a slave revolt. And then, you know, always within the first 10 or 15 minutes, it would be something like, of course, Black women didn't undermine their men by participating in this, you know, organized violent uprising, you know. Um, and, you know, when feminist historians sort of stepped onto the scene, you know, decade, couple decades later, they kind of gave them that and said, well, okay, if women didn't participate in this, then um, let's look at the, all the other types of slave resistance. I mean, this was the period where the weapons of the week was very in and in history and uh, in anthropology, but it's like, you know, these individual acts of resistance, um, you know, that were maybe less violent, maybe less confrontational, but perhaps even more effective. And we need to hold these up and, and honor them, which I completely agree with. But I wouldn't give up, I, I just didn't want to concede that ground that women weren't involved in that. That didn't make any sense to me. And when I told my dissertation advisor that I wanted to write on women in slave revolt, she said to me, you know, I'm sure they did it, but, uh, you're never gonna find the documents. And that like, is like raving a red flag in front of a bull, right? <laughs> like I will <laughs> find the documents. And so, ironically, women are all over the sources. So it's not just simply that they're not there. It's more complicated than that, right? So tell us, how, how is it more complicated? And so, so you have your advisor who says, no, uh, this, you're, uh, good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck, good luck with that. <laughs> so so, so it, it briefly, what, what, what do you do next? And, and, and where do you go? Right. And so when you get a PhD in history and you're writing your dissertation, I mean, you, you have to focus or specialize on a particular historical period, right? And my focus was British America, particularly 18th century. Um, and so looking, and I'm from New York City. So, um, you know, there, there are some very sort of un, very hardly talked about uh, slave revolts that occurred in New York City in the early 1700s. And um, I decided to look at the court records for those revolts. And I think, you know, because I have this background in law, a lot of my research is legal. And that's convenient because for people who are like the subaltern, I mean, people who are just like at the bottom of the scale of, you know, it, you know in society, sometimes the only place they show up is in court records. Um, and so 
I went to New York and, you know, the stuff is just like literally on the original parchment, you know, it's still there disintegrating in the municipal archives in New York um, and found women, you know, found women in the sources, found women uh, described in the colonial governor's letter when he was writing to the to Queen Anne and her Privy Council. Um, yeah, so the sources were there. Um, they, they were there and, and, and yet, uh, Dr. Hall, to, to, to really tell the story, and I, I'm quoting you here, um, you said you wanted to do justice to their story with all the available resources that you had, and you say many of these are legal, of course, but then you write, but I also wanted to add the parts we don't know, but could be true. Right. I just right. want to say that again, it's really important. You wanted to add the parts we don't know, but could be true. So this is now, you're taking an extra step, which of course, historians do all the time. That's essentially the work of the further you go back in history <laughs> and, and the fewer kind of tangible resources that we have, the more that you're adding parts yes. that you possibly think you could be. Can you speak about this filling the gap as it were? Yeah, right, right. So, I mean, I think it's important, like you're pointing out that historians are always constructing narratives, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, an event happens like what the collapse of the Roman empire, I don't know, some specific event the French Revolution, and that happens, right? But our understanding of what happened and what it means and whatever, that's, these are narratives constructed by historians. Um, but, I, but what I did in this, uh, like a chapter and a half of the 10 chapters of the book, I took it, but I feel like it's a step further and I call it um, the measured use of historical imagination. Because what I couldn't find in any of the documents was anything about what these, who these women were, what did they care about? Uh, what motivated them in that moment to do what they did. Um, and, you know, the court records, you know, was so frustrating, discuss this in the book, you know, there's like, you know, having said no more for herself than she had previously said, she's been sentenced to execution and well, you know, and then I'm like, oh, what did she previously say? And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, and it's like, it's not, it's not recorded. So what's like, when people are creating these chronicles, um, what they consider important is what goes in the chronicle, you know? Um, people have this idea that chronicles are just objective, like people are writing down what's happening, you know? But like the great example in the brilliant book, um, Silencing the Past by Michelle Ruff Truo, where he writes about the Haitian Revolution, you know, he says like, you know, like if you're chronicling an event, let's say you're describing a baseball game, which just would put me right to sleep. I can't stand baseball. But anyway, um, you know, they're talking and they're talking and it seems like they're talking a lot. So they must be describing everything, right? That's the chronicle, right? But they're not talking about how many hot dogs are sold in the stands or, you know, I mean, there are all these things that are just not considered relevant. So what these women cared about, why they did what they did, uh, that's just not recorded anywhere. So, but what I'm doing, which is different than fiction, is carefully researching and describing something that absolutely, absolutely could have happened. Um, not something that, you know, could not have happened. And so I think people need to understand the depth of the research in these parts. Um, you know, for example, in the, the section on the 1712 revolt and the four women who are mentioned in the legal documents, um, you know, they, they sort of, there's a, a point where, so the governor, Robert Hunter, the, it, the colonial governor, writes to the queen that there's been a revolt, and he explains how you know the enslaved people tied you know tied themselves to each other by the blood of each other's hands, and you know swore to secrecy about their plans, and you know and this is this is an oathing ceremony, and the people in New York City at this time were primarily from the Akan diaspora, so those are people from what's now Ghana. And there were revolts all over British America. There are a lot of Akan people. Uh, so I looked at a revolt just a couple decades later where it, detailed documentation of what these oathing ceremonies looked like, these Akan oathing ceremonies. And that was documented because enslavers wanted to warn people, if you see any slaves picking up graveyard dirt, watch out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there might be a revolt. And that's kind of, that's the thing that goes to the reading against the grain, right? I mean, documents are created for a particular purpose. In that case, it was to prevent slave revolt. For me, I use it to get description of how the revolt happens, you know? And then, you know, setting it in New York in 1700, there, there are no photos, you know? So I spent like 20, you know, I wrote like 20, researched 20 years of, you know, the really petty 
New York City Council minutes, you know, where they're like constantly arguing with each other about this neighborhood doesn't do their proper weeding. And I'm like, oh, okay, so they're, this neighborhood, we're gonna have a lot of weeds growing and, you know, and, and we're gonna light the city by every third house in the dark of the night, we'll put out a candle lantern from their roof. And then people are complaining how much the candles cost. I mean, it's just like, but from all right. these details, you can actually create an accurate depiction of something. Mm, 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 mm. So, so that there are there are the, there are the the background details, as it were. Mm -hmm. So, how much grass and and how the, uh, <laughs> for example, uh, and and how, and the lighting. But there's also the images of these people who are um, mm -hmm. revolting, um, who mm -hmm. are being murdered, um, mm -hmm. who are enslaved literally on the page how did mm -hmm. you work with Hugo Martinez who as you say is brilliant um how did you work with him to come up with these people's faces and their mm -hmm. kind of characters visually yeah yeah so um we had to do a lot of visual research and and you know when I started on this project I'm like it's not going to take so long because I've already done all the research and then I was like oh wow I never paid attention to anything visual when I was writing my dissertation. So then it took me like another year and a half to do all this visual research. And Hugo helped with that, you know, so he would have ideas of like, okay, so we know that, you know, three quarters of the enslaved people charged in this revolt are Akan. Let's look at current Akan people. And then let's use, I mean, he would use kind of that to help him design, you know, the, the faces and, you know, what, what they wore, all of that comes from like, you know, detailed research about what people wore then. And, you know, even the, there's a situation where an enslaved woman in, in the revolt helps another um, to have an abortion. And there, there's a plant, an abortifacient. But, you know, we looked at what plants were abortifacients that grew in New York at this time of year in this decade, you know, and that's the plant. You know, um, a, the lot funny of, a lot of plants. I am just going to show um, just another quick image here. This is um, from this is a really powerful image. You can see these women. Um, and so here we can see we have the faces, we have the expressions, and we have, as you say, the um, what they're wearing. And here's even a plant in the corner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was already controversial enough. I didn't want someone coming for me because I had the wrong tree or something. <laughs> you know? Um, this when is you say it's already controversial enough, what do you mean? Well, that women were involved in slave revolts. Mm. You know, that was con controversial. It's funny because I think the general public nowadays are like, yeah, of course, whatever. Um, but there are still historians who are like, no, that didn't happen. And mm. yeah, I mean, so. So, yeah. so tell us um, in your in your research, the, the most compelling moments. So in other words, your, your dissertation advisor says, not possible, good luck. And you come back with ample evidence um, that you found. What, let just tell us two or the most compelling um, kind of eureka moment, you know, when you're in the archive and you think, yes, women yes. did revolt and I am gonna make this the centerpiece of my, of my argument. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for me, the most powerful example of that had to do with slave ship revolts. Um, because I found stuff that people hadn't found before and they should have found it if they had listened to their own research. So, um, you know, in the late nineties, you know, the internet and you've got digital humanities and all of these historians who had been researching the Atlantic slave trade, you know, for a long time, pulled all of their data into this database uh, and called it the Atlantic slave trade database, which is still online, still free to use, you know, and being quantitative historians, they would like, you know, they created this database and then they queried it, right? <laughs> and um, the first thing they asked was how many revolts were there? So of 36,000 slave ship voyages uh, in this database, how many revolts were there? And they found that there was one in one out of 10 ships, which was more than anyone expected because it's very difficult and also almost always suicidal. Um, and then they just looked at, well, what's the difference between the ships that had revolts and the ships that didn't have revolts? And they found that the ships that had revolts, the only difference is that there was more women on the ship. And then they immediately dismissed their own findings and said, but of course we know that women did not in, were not involved in this type of 
uh, uh, resistance or revolt. And so I took that information and when I went to the UK, um, one of the things that I understood you know, in sort of the legal history that I've done is that you know, the slave trade was a highly regulated legislated uh, institution. There were laws and regulations you know, governing all aspects of it. You know, it wasn't some download business. Download business. It was like the main enterprise, right? Especially for the UK in the 18th in the 18th century. And so I looked at regulations, and, and they're actually regulated so that so that on a slave ship, when the ship when the ship was on the coast of Africa, everybody was below deck and chained, and that's because there was more likely to be something that's called a cutoff, where people would come to the ship and try to break people free. And, um, and then, but as soon as the ship left the coast, the women were brought on deck and left unchained. And this is where the weapons were, you know? And this is what gave them, uh, you know, mobility that they needed. And so looking qualitatively at captain's logs and ship surgeon's logs, you know, I would see over and over again, a description of like, these women did this, these women did that, or, document where I really had to read against the grain where it could only have happened because of the women like there was a third revolt on the ship today and we don't know how it happened because we keep checking the men's chains morning and night and you know um so one of the things that gives me access to this is is that you know Lloyds of London and other I mean Lloyds of London got their start ensuring the slave trade and it you know slave trade insurers insured against a policy that was for revolt um, and that was called um, the insurrection of cargo. So you would buy insurance, right, um, in case your cargo insurrects. Anyway, um, the, so because of that, the slave ship captains had to keep very detailed documentation about each revolt uh, for insurance purposes. So yeah, all these little pieces coming together in these weird yeah. angles is what got me to this history of these women involved in revolt after revolt after revolt mm. on slave ships during the Middle Passage. Mm -mm -mm. I want to talk also, um, Dr. Hall, about um, uh, just just the process of it in terms of your own, of course, personal connection to the subject matter and also um, just how when any, you know, when any historian is, is researching any kind of difficult topic, um, hor horrifying topic, it's, it creates this kind of, you, ha you find yourself having this strange relationship to the subject matter because you are so immersed in it um, mm -hmm. and you are dealing, as you say, with such a wide uh, swath of data. I I I'll use your words, um, you put it very eloquently. You write that this is some of the most disturbing material a, history a historian of slavery has to think through and that you felt nauseous as you read all of the entries of, of, of brutal deaths and uh, death by violence, death by starvation, death by rape. Um, but there's this interesting mixture, you, you say, of stultifying boredom, anger and nausea. And you said that you felt sickened by your emotional withdrawal and, and coldness in the face of atrocity, because essentially to get through the research, to do the research, in some sense, you have to turn off that emotional part of you and as you write, shut down your heart. Can you speak to this, please? Yeah, I mean, you just described it perfectly. <laughs> I don't know what more I can say other than, you know, what would happen. So like that was, you know, when I was uh, reading the uh, hundreds and hundreds of slave ship captains logs. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm in the UK, I've got a research grant. It gives me six weeks, you know, um, I need to get through all these logs and, um, and so I need to be like on it, you know? And so that process that I was describing would eventually then collapse at some point, like something would hit me and it would be just like, oh, and it would be just too much. And then I'd have to like go back to my hotel and like crash face down on the bed for like two days. Um, and then I had to then get myself together to go do this again. Um, so it's, it's always kind of a balance and you know, trying to figure out how to keep mental health, or at least enough mental health to keep functioning. Mm. You know, I mean, the study of slave resistance and slave revolt. I mean, I didn't originally come go back to grad school to study that. I wanted to study sort of the origins of race-based chattel slavery in America and its 
interactions with gender, what I call racialized gender. Um, but I learned pretty quickly that it was a really bad mental health formula to study slavery and not study slave resistance. And so that's how I ended up in this sort of whole area. And so even though this is incredibly disturbing, you know, I'm not interested in portraying the horrors of slavery. You know, there's, there's a lot of that, you know, I'm, I feel like what we can get from it is the incredible resilience of the people who went through this and, and to reclaim the resistance. Um, because, you know, if a people go through something horrible like that, um, and the resistance to it is erased, it's a very kind of shaming experience. I don't know if you guys follow that guy, Kanye West, I barely do, but like, uh, I don't know, a year ago or something, he said like, well, if we were slaves for 400 years, we must've consented to that. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> you know? Or at the same time during the um, uprisings around the George Floyd murder, you know, there's this famous, there's a big a photo that gets said a lot on social media of a young black woman wearing a t-shirt that said, this is not my ancestors uprising, you know, and the, the implication being we're serious this time, you know, and I felt so sad because I know how history's taught. I know how this history is taught. She had no opportunity to learn anything about resistance to enslavement. This is, I had a question about this and I'm really glad you brought it up because um, what's at stake, it seems to me, I mean, so much at stake in, in your uh, graphic narrative, Dr. Hall, but what is at stake? Um, one of the questions that is raised, a huge question is how should we tell history and what history should we tell? And this is, as it's, it's, a, it's a hotly contested topic in, in America right now. And I would- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, it, 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 it more, more so than in France, frankly. Um, and... Yeah, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. It's like, but the thing is, though, is it's, it's not really new. I mean, I think it's important for people to know, like this graphic narrative, I like, I had been at, at this point, when I started working on it, I had been fired for the fourth time for teaching race, when I had been specifically hired to teach race. And so now that all of this stuff is going on, you know, with this critical race theory and not in schools and whatever, I feel like I'm just in the front row eating popcorn watching this, you know? And when I decided like, okay, if I'm leaving all of this, you know, edu field, you know, my biggest regret is that all this work is behind this academic wall that no one will ever read, you know? And that's when I decided to do this, but I didn't think it would blow up, you know? I mean, it's like, I thought maybe like, a few people I would self-publish, maybe a few people would be interested. We had this little Kickstarter. Hugo, you know, he went to art school and he drew some web comics, but he was working full-time as a pedicab driver in New Orleans. So it was just like, whoa, this is new. And then it just kind of kept going. And now it's gonna be published in German, French, Spanish, Turkish, Korean, and Japanese. <laughs> of course, I, I'm not surprised. Um... <laughs> But it, it, the, again, the, the question is still there, um, it, especially on, for me and, and, this, and this, the form of, your, of this graphic narrative begs the question too, that do we need to tell not only, of course, new, new histories, but does the form of history need to change to accommodate um, the histories that we're telling? What do you think? Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm just trying, I just am pausing because I'm like form, like how deeply do you mean that? Because I know you've gone <laughs> deeply in it in your own education too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there is this sort of uh, very, this very typical narrative structure in the United States anyway, about um, how, how social change happens. And it's very top down, you know, uh, Lincoln freed the slaves, uh, so Martin Luther King had a dream. I'm like, oh, so it's like he had a cream, he had a bean. Like, it just doesn't matter. You know, people haven't even listened to that incredible speech, the whole speech. They just remember that half sentence and wield it however they want. Even the most reactionary white supremacists are using this, I have a dream thing. And Rosa Parks was just, she was just so tired one day and she sat down, you know, not like she was a lifelong activist. So this, 
so I think the form of historical narrative, it can be very much do, be engaged in what I call a pacification of resistance. And this is not just a abstract problem because this denies people the tools with which they can change their world. If they believe that everything happens top down, then they don't know where they're gonna put their focus or energy. You know, and they'll say things like, oh, we just need another leader like Dr. King. I mean, Dr. King, I mean, he was a great person, you know, but like the, in the famous Montgomery bus boycott, he didn't organize that. A bunch of local women in, in Montgomery organized that. And then they knew they needed a man's face to come in and rep it, you know, and they asked him to come. Um, so yes, that's a, that's a structural form and it does, you know, it's pacification by history book history. You know, it's, it's very, it's very dangerous. Um, yeah. I'm also thinking, uh, let, let's go deeper in, in the definition of form. Um, graphic novels, uh, films, podcasts, other, other f f forms. What about them? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I might, felt like that was half a sentence. Can you finish the other? <laughs> might, might they be needed to tell, tell these histories? In, in other words, get away from the history, the, the textbook, the, the novel, the, um, the monograph, for instance. Mm, I don't think we should get away from monographs. Uh, I think there's brilliant okay. ones and they do amazing work. Okay. Um, textbooks are horrid. And I've never, I never teach with textbooks. My brief career as a high school teacher, I actually just got notification that my high school teaching lesson has been revoked because I participated in a sit-in against a private prison ICE facility in 2018 and was charged with uh, disorderly conduct. And so that was a criminal thing. And so whatever, my teaching license has just been revoked. Um, why did I go there? High school, yes, my high school teaching career. Textbooks, textbooks. I, refuse, I refuse to use a textbook. Um, I just think it's, it's horrible. And the way, I don't know how it's taught in France, but I don't know, it, I think it takes a special skill set to take something as exciting and important as history and make it stultifying and boring. Like, I, I, it amazes me that people are able to do that. And so most people walk away from their high school history experience traumatized and think it's about memorizing a bunch of dates and people who have no relevance in their life, you know, and it's just, it's very frustrating. So in some, in some ways, Dr. Hall, do you see that the, uh, another project of Wake is to reinvigorate the discipline of history and, and make it feel compelling and energizing? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, because I wasn't expecting it to have such a big impact and I wasn't expecting the whole array of people that were drawn to this book to be drawn to this book, um, it has made me realize this is powerful and this can work. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there are all kinds of really kind of geeky ways we can talk about the methodology of the graphic narrative and why it works and why it's engaging and why it pulls people in and how you deal with how you can get people ending up reading weird things like Dom Regina and, you know, and, and still getting into it, you know. Um, and so, so yes, I think that this is a particularly unique medium where you can maintain the complexity, as I said earlier, but then get it out there, you know? And, you know, there are also popular histories that are written by historians, um, and some of them do a great job of that. But the regular sort of history books written by historians are really written for historians. And they, they we had to read them so much in grad school that they don't intimidate me or bore me anymore, but man, I mean, no one could just, like, most people are not gonna pick up a book like that and read it. Um, I have one more question for you, Dr. Hall, and then we have lots of questions and comments in the chat. If you haven't posted your question or comment in the chat for Dr. Hall, I urge you to do that now so I can get to them as I turn to that part of the conversation. I suppose my final question is, um, since, since Evenings with an Author is as much about nonfiction, it is about fiction, and I was struck by um, a moment in the book where you're teaching um, Toni Morrison's Beloved um, as in conjunction with, with the history from, um, uh, from, what, from whence it came. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think uh, literature can do 
so in this case, um, beloved can do that maybe history can't do. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not a lit person. It's not my background, training, or inclination. Um, I read nonfiction and then science fiction. <laughs> um, but but I think um, a book like Beloved. I mean, there's no other book like Beloved. So, but I mean, I think uh, that book allows people to really access um, the emotions and the issues facing um, people in a way that a kind of a history monograph is not, is not going to do. And also, uh, you know, her, her feelings were not really documented. You know, it's based on a true case. Um, but, you know, her experiences and stuff, that, that stuff's not documented. So, um, and I think, I mean, correct me if I don't know if I'm, I read somewhere, it was actually a review of my book, that Toni Morrison was the first book that tried to, in liter literary format, really delve into the middle passage. And the middle passage is often this sort of kind of black box where people are like, uh, we can't process it. So there's nothing to process. And then it becomes this thing where it's like, you know, the people who came out of that process were somehow a race of their identity. And, you know, so, so my thing is like, oh, let's talk about slave ship revolts. Let's talk about how people who came to the Americas through the middle passage came from, we can track exactly where they came from, you know? Um, and so Toni Morrison for me, I've taught it a few times in like uh, upper division seminars uh, because it's so powerful and because um, I think it, and then like we have discussion afterwards. And like I said, I'm not a lit professor. I don't know if I'm asking the right lit questions, <laughs> but you know, people talk about like what that experience was like to read that book and trying to imagine themselves in the main character's uh, position and what could make a person kill her own child and how would that impact you? And so it deals with the issue of haunting and slavery and haunting is crucial. And haunting is a central theme in Wake. And if you know the book Beloved, in a way it's a long <laughs> tribute to her down to like chapter titles and you know, things like that. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn to the questions and comments we received in the chat, um, Dr. Hall. So we have a question from Tina who writes, thank you for speaking tonight. I'm a social studies teacher and following with incredible frustration and deep sadness, the backlash and movement to censor the teaching of history that as you described is true and scary. Can you speak to the teacher loyalty bills that are being pushed through legislative bodies throughout the US? What advice <laughs> can you give educators across the country who are struggling with this in their schools and districts? Thank you, Tina. Across the United States? Um, yeah, I don't know that I'm the best person because like I said, I was driven out of teaching. Um, so, and ironically now I'm hired to design curriculum for the entire state of New York. It's kind of like this interesting kind of revenge story because of this book, right? But um, <laughs> it's like, you only let me in your classroom in this weird state I live in, but yeah, I get to shape the whole curriculum now <laughs> for the entire state. Um, it's, I don't know what advice to give people. And, you know, I have a very dark view about what's happening in the United States. Um, I try not to share it because I try not to depress people. But frankly, I feel like we have one year to two years max of any semblance of participatory doc democracy. And um, I feel like we are already in a cold civil war. And I can only see that intensifying because the, you know, the ultra right in this country are convinced that, first of all, they're terrified of replacement, you know, which it's like, I mean, it, 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 like we are being replaced, white people are being replaced. Um, and, and at the same time, they think that all the rules have been broken, right? The last election was stolen. So if all the rules are broken and you're being replaced, uh, that's existential and you'll do whatever. And one of the things I think, and, and this is manifesting in these endless laws, you know, forbidding teachers. And I, I work with a lot of teachers, high school teachers, because we create curriculum. And it's just terrifying. 
It's like, oh, what if I say this the wrong way? You know, and I think what ultimately is going to happen or what needs to happen is all these teachers need to rise up, <laughs> you know, and revolt. And also I've seen a lot of high school students being like, what? You don't want us to read what books? Okay, now we're having a book club reading those exact books, you know, which I love. I love that about teenagers. <laughs> teenagers are actually my favorite to teach of all the, from law school to grad school to college. Um, so I don't know how it's gonna play out. And I don't know that I have any great advice um, either, but I wanna point out that it's not new. It's just yeah. very overt right now. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the solaces about being a historian or having had historical training is nothing's ever really that new, is it? Mm -mm. No, there's nothing new under the sun. It can be really depressing. You know, yeah. and when Trump was elected here, so suddenly everyone wanted to know what historians had to say. Usually people don't care what historians have to say. They think it's boring. Like you go to a party and it's like, what a historian? And then they go find someone else to talk to, you know? Um, but uh, suddenly everyone's like, what's going on? Can you put this in some kind of context? And it's like, well, yes. Do you want to hear? <laughs> you know? So it's been, it's been yes. interesting. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Exactly. Um, Nita uh, writes, Dr. Hall mentioned that one particular page took, took 40 hours of work to design and illustrate. How many hours in total did this masterpiece take? <laughs> Additionally, I focus on the true representations of people slash communities. It is genius how you came up with the facial features of people from Ghana. Thank you. How long did the whole thing take? Yeah. Wow. I don't know. How much sleep did you lose? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, but the whole thing was, it was actually generally a joyful process because it's like, oh, wow, this is getting work. This is working. Like a big publisher just picked this up, you know, like, uh, but I, 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 the page that you posted of the ship's wake, I remember how long that one took because we tried it again and again and again, and it looked it was bad and confusing every time. And so I remember how many hours that one took. I don't think I could tell you all together, all the hours, but it was a full-time job for me and Hugo for almost two years. So, yeah. So two years, how many, however many hours, two years. I wanna show just another image that I really uh, loved. Um, this oh, wow. That was so hard. <laughs> oh good, I, so I am. I somehow I'm finding the right the right ones. Well, because I, I I just love the ones where there's this real vortex of you and the history. And can you speak to this one? Oh wow, this was so hard for me to script this. I was like, because it was like I was drawing on my dissertation and this sort of process about the back and forth correspondence between the colonial governor and the Queen's Privy Council. Mm -hmm. That's some dry stuff. And it's also kind of like uh, in the dissertation, I could go into detail about it and it's like, okay, well, yeah, that's the history dissertation. But it's like, I have to like talk about this in some way that's engaging and visualize it, like make it visual. And it was literally probably the hardest part of this going back and forth, trying to track down the correspondence and until the trail grew cold. Um, and so Hugo came up with the idea of turning the correspondence into this sort of vortex. Um, and I was like, go with that, fine. <laughs> you know, Cause I had given up. Like I, in the script, I'm supposed to say like, I would like it to be portrayed this way. And, and it's like, I have no idea. And I like, I probably wrote like six drafts each of which I threw out, I just, I just hated it. This was actually really difficult. And, you know, a lot of times it's like in this kind of book, like you're writing the historical research process. Like most people don't know what historians actually do. And, um, and it's not a lot of action. You know? So it's like, you're trying to like uh, activate it, you know, in a visual way. So it's a kind of interesting <laughs> challenge. And this page is it's a great example. I, I want to go to another page. I'm hoping I'm in the right. Let me see. I need to move this. Okay. Let's see if I can get this right. So, um, this goes to a question. So now people. Okay, here we go. Um, this is you with your partner, Bea B. Bea, yeah, she's Bea. from Berlin. Yeah. And and your son. And this gets to a question that Colleen asks. Um, I'm glad you mentioned mental health. I was going to ask how you stayed balanced during your work research 
you already spoke so eloquently on it, unless you'd like to say more. I think it is important, Dr. Hall, if you wouldn't mind just speaking a little bit more about the, your, the personal narrative, the through line through the story. I mean, you mentioned that you use it as a kind of narrative device to piece together these disparate um, moments of research, but I, I really was struck by these moments where you go home, you speak to your, your partner, you spend time with your son, um, and it grounds uh, grounds this in a way. Can you just speak a little bit more to, to that? And yeah, that yeah, Bea, we've now been together 32 years. Yeah. And that little dude just turned 24. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and uh, he's, he's very, hand. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I sent Hugo like baby toddler pictures of him. So, so then he could then draw them. And I don't know if you, but I was like, I want people to see, I'm reading The Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. I want people to understand that I read things for fun and that's part of my mental health. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, therapy. Yeah, <laughs> therapy is crucial. Um, and uh, some kind of pacing. Mm. I'm, I'm not really great at it, frankly, um, because I have this thing where I kind of work until I drop. It's mm -hmm. just my mode. Uh, and it's been very hard for me to break that into different ways. I've tried over decades to try, well, what if I try it this way? What if I, it doesn't work It all? It's always like that. Mm -mm. So, but I think the fact that it is a struggle and the ongoing struggle needs to be talked about. So mm -hmm. the question I think is a really good one. And I, and I quote this, you know, famous Audre Lorde yeah, yeah. quote, you know, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It's a it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Final question. Uh, I think there was one up here. Um, okay, this is from Patrick. Patrick Banks is in the audience who I just want to say a big hello to who helped me put together all of the programming. Um, I wonder if we can spotlight Patrick. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> Hi. Can we can yeah. we bring you in? <laughs> I'll see if I can unmute you. Hello. Oh, oh, oh. You're Are here. you in Paris also? Oh wait. Okay, there we go. Can Hello. you hear me? Do, yeah. Do you wanna, yeah. So this is this is for everyone. This is Patrick Banks. Um, he is a um, he works for Little Africa in Paris, and he's helped me to put together all of the programming. Uh, for Black History Month at the American Library in Paris and beyond. We're going to work together beyond this. Um, okay. <laughs> it's more um, than a month. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, Patrick, wh why don't you ask your question? <laughs> so, um, Dr. Hall, I um, uh, love the, this whole concept and, you know, the retelling of this history or actually discovering this history of, mm. you know, for me to hear that out of every one in 10 slave ships, there was a revolt is yeah. kind of mind blowing. It makes it you think about this in a totally different way. And so one of the, the things that I was kind of thinking of as, as I listened to you talk, did you determine any patterns of, um, you know, whether people who were um, enslaved from particular regions or tribes were more likely to engage in slave revolts because I know there were patterns on, in the US where they would try not to congregate um, certain enslaved people from certain tribes because they felt they were, as they would say, more rebellious. Yeah, yeah, this is a fascinating, fascinating question. Um, I, I actually don't use the term top tribes. I use the word nations or nation states. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so one of the things uh, that was part of my dissertation, which wasn't so much part of this is, looking at sort of, there's a very highly developed female martial tradition in West and West Central Africa where the, where the people caught up in the slave trade came from. And as you, you know, um, and, and what, and I think, I mean, it would take a lot more study. Some of this discussion of like among, you know, enslavers about we want to purchase this type of enslaved person versus this type of enslaved person. Some of that was just based on like, I don't know, conjecture, rumor or whatever. Uh, a lot of those decisions were based on, oh, we're growing rice. We are Europeans. We have no idea how to grow rice. Grow Let's rice, yeah. get those people from Sierra Leone, which is now Sierra Leone, to come and teach us how to grow rice or, or whatever. And, you know, like Igbo people had a reputation to committing suicide and you know, Alcon people had this reputation of being, you know, extremely uh, rebellious. And 
Um, but I don't know how to really, it would be a whole project to try to really track that. Right. Um, okay. You know, with, but you could, but if any place you look at with specificity, so my focus on New York in the early 1700s, like I was saying earlier, um, a large percentage of the enslaved people, I mean, New York was 20% enslaved in this time period. Uh, the only other city that had that many enslaved people was Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and uh, a lot of them were Akan people, like from the Akan diaspora, mm -hmm. you know, um, the diaspora being internal conflicts happening there and certain groups being kind of colonized by the Ashanti empire. And I mean, it's all very complicated, this West African history. I had to actually specialize, like that was one of, one of my areas I had to learn. <laughs> but um, so I only know how to do that in specific locations. Okay. There's an incredible scholar, um, and I'm gonna blank on his name, which is embarrassing, but he, he wrote this amazing book about slave revolts that happened in Cuba. And one of the things that he found was that the enslaved people who were brought there were like from, uh, were Dahomey and, uh, and uh, Oyo, or like Yorubans, Yorubans mm -hmm. and they had been fighting each other. And a lot of enslaved people were like, people who got who were like uh, war captives and they, they were fighting each other they were highly advanced militarily they knew how to use muskets and all the weaponry that existed and then they the, the slave traders stupidly brought them all to cuba yeah. they all also could speak to each other like people are like oh they can't speak among themselves so they can't i mean you know it's like how english is kind of a lingua franca but you know they could communicate. So suddenly they're not fighting each other anymore. They just turned it all around and there, and there were tons of women involved in that, like generals leading that. Um, so I think go with specificity. I don't know how to do a big, a big trend. Someone might be able to, but I don't know. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I think that help answer your, your question. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the body of work is, you know, I actually feel like maybe that is another book, but <laughs> absolutely, so, and there, yeah. Because um, you know, I've always heard and through reading, you know, narratives there, you know, you know, and like you said, it could have been conjecture, et cetera. But um, they definitely try to keep certain groups from, you know, being within the same right. radius of each other and that right. type of thing. And one of the things that we learn, it, you know, in historical method is not is to make sure to not con to conflate like proscriptive literature with, you know, descriptive. Right. Mm -hmm. So in other words, like this describes what happened versus the this is what we think should be happening, you know. Right. And so a lot of these documents that discuss this are kind of more like proscriptive. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's going to be a tricky research project. I, I support whoever does it. But excitingly, we know now exactly where which cultures and which nations enslaved people came from all mm -hmm. through basically the americas so mm -hmm. so when you see revolts for example in the french colony of louisiana mm -hmm. you know you know those are bambara people you know okay. and then you know that that you know subsequently they are fawn people and if they're fawn people uh then you're going to have a lot of women warriors because i mean the Dahomey literally fielded an army of 10,000 women. So, um, okay. yeah. And I'm actually from Louisiana, so. Oh, good. <laughs> good.